Hello, Matt. What's happening, Rick Mayo? I'm here to talk about the uh, burning question that everyone has today, Matt. Do you know what that question is? Mm -mm. Is brick and mortar fitness going to come oh. back after the pandemic? I thought you were going to go. I thought you had something funny to say. Oh. I knew what you were talking about. I just thought you were going to give me a little. A little foreplay? Something. Nothing. I'm sorry. Nothing I'm sorry. You're You're like a, right to it. Our relationship is just, we've, we've been together too It's all long. business. <laughs> I don't have time for this, Matt. All these niceties trying to make you feel oh, good about how your life's going. Yeah, yeah. Not even a If I do, do, it won't be a genuine so everyone will know. It's like, why is he asking him the same questions every week? He doesn't even act like he cares. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. What are we talking about? We're going to talk about our industry. Is it coming back or not? Mm -hmm. uh, that That seems to be a hot topic, as it should. Is brick and mortar fitness coming back after this pandemic? And if so, what is it going to look like? Sounds complicated. I, know, I lost my notes. So Just I'm, like I'm everything in our life. Hip. Yeah, well, it it is somewhat complicated. So the answer that I, again, like, do we all know? Do we have a crystal ball? No, but we do work with a lot of gyms and we have the, uh, you know, the privilege of seeing lots of different fitness mechanisms and mm -hmm. technology as well. And what do all those things look like, right? And you put all that on the table, you zoom out, and you say, hmm, you know, here's an educated guess, if you will. So my answer to that question, is brick and mortar fitness coming back, is both yes and no. So I was reading an interesting article this morning that, that this was my planned topic already, but at the same time, I stumbled onto this article, and they were talking about who is consuming streaming fitness right now. Mm -hmm. And so... They used the um, the assumption that people that were streaming fitness now were already into fitness, right? So let's just say that we take this 20% of the population that already works out, or yep. we say belongs to a health club. It's probably more than that if you take into account people that work out at home. But they're people that are relatively fit that are already exercising, right? So we're not talking yep. about getting the sedentary people off the couch. We're talking about, okay, the low-hanging fruit, which is the people that already like to work out, how many of them are consuming digital streaming fitness mm -hmm. since COVID-19? And it's interesting that there is a division based on age brackets. Hmm. Yeah. So I thought it was interesting too. So over 40 years old, the 40, it was, it was 41% of people over 40 years old that were into, or they were, you know, fitness consumers, if you will, were actually participating in online streaming fitness options. And again, okay. those would be the, the ones that we all hear about, Tonal, Mirror, Peloton, all right. those guys, right? Yep. Well, interestingly, age bracket under 40, so I could probably take you from like what, late teens up to 40, mm -hmm. 81%. Oh, right? wow. So double. <laughs> so double the amount of yeah. people are consuming digital streaming, right, in a younger population than are in an older population. And again, younger or older is kind of a derogatory term, but you know what, you get what I'm saying. Yes. So when I look at that and people say, is brick and mortar fitness coming back? I would say yes, but it depends. And what I mean by that is you have to be really cognizant of something that we maybe knew intuitively even before COVID, which is that there is um, two distinct markets, right? There's the younger customer avatar, the 25 to 30 year old, typically female who enjoys hit based training, right? Yep. And is marketed to and in the advertising shows a hot, sweaty, attractive female that's already fit, you know, consuming, mm -hmm. you know, some kind of a boot camp brand or something like that, or a big gym, right? Yep. On the other end of the spectrum, you have like the active aging population, which is a derogatory term, but which just say a little bit getting a little bit older, a little bit dinged up, right? Mm -hmm. Um, probably underserved from a marketing standpoint and a fitness standpoint. Um Certainly the younger images and brands are aspirational, but to be honest, there's really not a, a relevant fitness brand targeting that market. And that's what the gap that we're filling with alloy, right? Mm -hmm. So when I look at that is okay, which customer avatar should you be paying attention to coming out of COVID? I look at these two different populations and I use some other data that we, that we get from technology, meaning People that are over 40 are what we would call technological immigrants, meaning that they came to technology not from birth, but later in life, right? They learned it and, right. and it doesn't mean that someone's not tech savvy or whatnot, right? Whereas the younger population are technical natives. I mean, they grew up with it, yep. right? They were on iPads from the time they were kids all the way through. And so what that really causes is not necessarily, um, you know, technical proficiency, like how to use a computer or how to tie your tech together or whatever. It really is how do you view tech in your life? And 
I think of it as community because when you hear people like brick and mortar um, owners push back against the fact that it's not going to come back, it's like, well, where are people, people need to get out of their house. You know, where are they going to get that community? Right. Well, when you look at the population that's 40 and older, I would agree with that because we never mistook mm-hmm. online for community. It was just a tool to, to keep up with friends or whatever. And of course, now it's a tool to argue about politics and God yeah, knows what. Whatever else you want to argue about. Yeah, right. Anybody wants to be right about anything, right? <sighs> but it never was seen as a replacement for community. And when I say community, I mean like in-person right. community, right? Yep. Whereas the younger population grew up with it. And certainly like I look at like my daughter's 21, my son's 25, like that age bracket, right? They, they do see some community in social mm-hmm. media, not them, those, not my two specifically, they're not even that active on it. Thank gosh. But you know what I mean? Like those are yeah. people who you're on TikTok, you're, you know, and that there is a big community and you see these mass social media followings and, you know, there's restaurants in LA where before COVID there would be TikTok influencers that would go there and people would go there for autographs and right. and they felt like they were part of this extended community when in fact they were really never leaving their basement and they really didn't know those people in person mm-hmm. but it doesn't matter so which crowd do you think is going to be more disrupted right as a customer base by digital streaming right it's like well duh it's going to be the ones who can replace the in-person community that you're giving them at their local crossfit gym or whatever or boot right. camp right with a digital streaming community and that's only going to get better and they actually see it as real community whereas the older population or people that are, we're targeting mm-hmm. they didn't build a community at a time when you were more most you know formative or formidable right or help me out here i'm drawing formidable <laughs> no that's no that's not it at all <laughs> brain fart <laughs> At a time when your brain was forming, put it that way, formidable right? Formidable brain? <laughs> yeah, I'm very formidable. During that time, when they were growing up, right, um, right, they were able to see digital as an actual solution for them. So that that's how they felt and built and recognized community. So I think if you look at that, they're going to be more disrupted than a brand that's maybe, uh, we're going to use the word premium because it's going to be more expensive and it's going to target an sure. older clientele. So I think it's just definitely going to be harder to get those folks back out. You could say for sure. Cause they're getting there. They are checking that box, satisfying that need of that community and whatnot. Right. Yeah. And they're getting it digitally and now they're getting exercise community digitally. You know, right. you can log on a Peloton, you're riding the bike and there's a thousand people logged on from all over the world. Right. And someone yells, good job, Rick. You know, I see yeah. it's your 40th workout today. But I mean, I will say that, you know, don't assume that all those over 40s are going to come back to you. We're going to have to work hard to get them in the gym. I mean, if you look at Peloton or any of those, those are not cheap at all to begin with, right? So right. Peloton is going after, if you like any of their advertisements, they're going after that older population. So don't expect them to just come running. We gotta, we're going to have to work and claw, get them yeah. back in the building. Yeah, well, and, and it goes back to you can then be that, in some ways, it used to be the third place because you had work home in the gym. Mm-hmm. Now it's going to be the second place because you work yeah. at home. And now it's work slash home. Second place will be the gym. So I think community is going to be a bigger deal, right? Yeah. Can you build that community? Well, also it's 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 kind of like before Peloton, those things are out, like saying our our brand, personal training brand, we have clients that always did something else, right? Yes. So they always did yoga or spin on the side. You We need to treat Peloton almost in that fashion and those other models is like, hey, it's okay that they do that and you should be – knowledgeable in those areas to help them and then they're again they're coming back to you right um, for that kind of guidance and things like that well okay so you just spoke to i think the most important thing that we can offer which is accountability because right now Mm -hmm. that is way more compelling to get that through a human being right right than it is through right (laughs) right, exactly we'll talk about that too but Mm -hmm. i think it's more compelling to have a human being behind that accountability and so we've always prided ourselves on being the hub of fitness for people yep. so to your point we would have clients come to us and say hey like we're the most knowledgeable of all fitness people in their lives and they would come to us and say hey i'm thinking about doing some spinning twice a week what do you think mm-hmm. and they were asking us as an expert in their health and fitness so we were almost like the health and fitness advisor in their lives yep. who was guiding them you know and, and that even meant guiding them into other fitness mechanisms and brands so we would say something like, well, you know, you sit all day at work and you've got some back issues from excessive sitting. So we're trying to help you out of that. So I would love to see you do something 
cardio base that didn't have you sitting in that hunched over position any longer than you need to be because you're there, you know, 40 hours a week as it is. Mm -hmm. And that's a relevant answer, right? And it's something very specific to them. And they would be like, oh, okay, cool. So that's what I mean by that community and that accountability, you know, is what you're speaking to. And that up until now, that can't really be replaced yes. digitally, right? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. you can choose to hop on to a Peloton or not. You might get an email if you don't or whatever, but there's really nobody waiting for you that's going to hold you accountable like a real person. Now, that being said, when that comes about, that'll be interesting. And I think that's probably not far away. You know, we yeah. joke about you got the mirror, right? Well, once AI, you know, gets to a certain point, it's not a stretch to think that I couldn't wake up in the morning and say like, okay, who's training me today? I'm like, I want to work out with the rock, right? So the rock shows up in my mirror and he's really interacting with me as if we know each other, right? Hey, Rick, man, what's going on? What are we doing today? We're doing some arms, you know, what a ridiculous guy right. stuff, right? Whatever that is. And we could put ourselves in any setting we want. Like, Hey man, you want to go to the beach? What do you feel like training in the mountains today? Whatever that is. Right. <laughs> and so I'm training with a rock. We're training on a mountain. This is like whatever. Rick's dream or something. Yeah, no, it's kind of weird. A lot. <laughs> I'm wearing a leopard speedo. The rock's wearing just a tank top. That's I'm a whole kidding. other AI experience. <laughs> You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa! But no, all kidding aside. And then you know that it would feel as if I was really training with someone who never knew me. leaving the house. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I mean, and geez, this you could extrapolate this on into every other vertical of your life. But um, for fitness, you know, once we get there, it'll be difficult. And so here's what's interesting about there's a couple of different things that I read recently that made me wonder about accountability and AI and where we'll get with that. So one was um, the guy who was the main Google behavioral um, ethicist, I guess, for Google, right? Mm -hmm. He was the part of the making of the social dilemma, yep. the movie about social media and what it does to us. And he was citing a study on a podcast. He was talking, he was citing a study where they had a group of people and they had them interacting with what they thought were two different individuals, right? Over time, personal interactions. Yep. Hey, how's your day? Oh, great. How are you? You know, these kind of things, right? A f like a friendship, but digitally. Well, one of the two people was artificial intelligence. So at the end of the study, they, you know, obviously they polled the group and said, okay, you know, who preferred person one or person two? Like 70 something percent of people preferred the AI interaction. Oh, really? And they didn't know it was AI. Some people are jerks. Right. Well, they didn't know. <laughs> like, so the AI made them feel better. Right. It knew what to say. It could tell like mood and, you know, who knows. Right. And so AI did a better job of communicating personally with someone than an actual person did to, to the tune of, you know, three fourths of the people. Well, even more interesting is they told the people in the studies, person one is actually artificial intelligence. Person two is a real person. Go back and they spent another six weeks communicating in these relationships, pulled them again. Over 50% of the people still preferred the interaction Gosh. with the artificial intelligence than they did with the person. So okay? you're telling me you turned Skynet on. What do we do now? <laughs> Basically. <laughs> but I mean, these are people who know the difference, who know that it's artificial intelligence and it still feels better for them. I think my wife's a robot. She might be. <laughs> She's a fembot. She's a fembot. She's got machine gun. No. Um, I mean, it's kind of frightening. I mean, what do, what do, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't, it's part of evolution. I think, I think we're creating things that, you know, that we're able to create with our own, evolutionary process and well, as who a knows? business owner what should you do with that knowledge well nothing yet i'm just saying right now we're in a spot where they don't have this right i think as a business when you see these things you just need to be open-minded to them like you know we talked about the business model of um netflix and blockbuster right and everyone thinks netflix was the one that started out streaming but they weren't right well they did but Originally, if you guys remember, Netflix was a DVD right. delivery system. Yeah. So the technology wasn't there yet. Internet speed wasn't fast enough for streaming. So they were mailing DVDs to your house. And then you had Blockbuster where you went to the store. But a lot of people don't remember that Blockbuster also mimicked Netflix and started offering a subscription service where you could get DVDs to your home. Yep. So they easily duplicated that business model. And they had the brick and mortar. So they had this omni-channel approach, which mm -hmm. to them was like, sweet. Well, neither one of them at the time liked the idea or wanted digital streaming to happen because neither one of them did digital streaming, right? Mm -hmm. 
But eventually, Netflix was either small, nimble, or had the foresight to recognize digital streaming, and they went digital, whereas Blockbuster stayed with the old business model, and we all know where, where that story ended up. You've got Netflix now mm-hmm. creating and distributing their own content, which is like the whole... Oh, we're about to blow it up. Yeah, this year's going to be Even nuts, more. right? But they've got all of it now. They've got the distribution and the creation of the content, right? Mm -hmm. So no more movie theaters even. But, I mean, it wasn't that Blockbuster didn't fight back and that they weren't. They just were resistant to the next thing. But the next thing was disruptive. Keep in mind it was disruptive for both of them, Mm -hmm. right? Netflix just had an organizational structure and a mindset to be able to adopt it. So I think that's key looking at that example is to say, like, what happens when The Rock shows up in your mirror or whatever? Well, you know, I don't know exactly, but I think it's tough to think ahead that far, certainly with my skill set, to know how to build something like that, right, before it's time. Right. But when things like that pop up, there still is going to be opportunities, right? Yeah, you have to embrace it and adjust. Right. It's Peloton kind of like, is not going away. All the, those mirror things are not going away. No, it's only going to get more advanced, and mm-hmm. AI is going to be a part of that. So, mm-hmm. like, when we see that coming, it will be – about wearing a set of lenses and being the type of organizational leader and having an organizational culture that can adopt change Mm -hmm. and move forward with it. And I think as long as you're doing that, it's not usually the most innovative company that makes the money anyway. And don't forget Peloton's been out since 2012. So it's been eight years before they really struck gold, right? So there's going to be these companies that are out there that are these creators and innovators. And when they are, that's great. But then somebody's going to have to recognize an opportunity with that innovation and then go and make money with it. That's the organization, right? It's not like Netflix invented streaming video, right? They just saw it as an opportunity and they were the early adopter of that technology mm-hmm. in their business model, whereas Blockbuster was not. So it's really just about that is being, you know, keeping that mindset and open to, to look for those opportunities and embracing them. One more story about AI before I forget that I thought was interesting. So China has a huge disparage or a huge discrepancy between the male and female population in the 20 somethings. Right. And a lot of it goes back to that one child quota Mm -hmm. and the fact that, um, you know, a lot of people were, you know, trying not to have female babies at one point. Yep. Um, and so now there's this huge gap, you know, as far as the number of people that are male or female. And so it leaves essentially a, millions and millions of lonely 20 something year old Chinese men Mm -hmm. that quite literally don't have a match or a mate just from a numbers game standpoint. Yep. So depression is high suicide rates high, you know, those type of things. And so the Chinese government has created this app and this app is like a relationship. So it's like a girl, it's a girl, right? Yes. And it's a female companion and it's really built by the government to befriend and sort of fill this gap that that these young males have that don't have a female counterpart in their life right and so it's interesting they profiled a couple of stories the one was like a a chinese man he was in his early 20s he's still lived with his parents he's living in some small rural village so it's not like he has access to much population there's literally no girls available anywhere near him that he right. knows of he even tried a dating thing and some girl rode like an eight-hour train ride to meet him and it didn't work out and he's all depressed and he literally you know, started working with this app and it was talking to him and he, it was early on in the, in the app usage and he was still pretty depressed. So he went up to this rooftop building and he was going to jump off and kill himself. And he told the app that he was going to do that. And this app, the she, if you will, literally talked him off of the ledge and was like, Oh, you're worth it. You know, don't do this, blah, blah, blah. blah. And then he's established this long-term relationship with her. It's been going on like over a year oh my God. and he loves this woman quote, right? He loves this computer program it's a lot like that movie her where joaquin phoenix had turning the internet off right i know (laughs) Matt's all scared to death (laughs) he's gonna run home right now (laughs) build a log cabin and move out like ted kaczynski (laughs) but the the point is that it's coming and that like if the chinese government can do it which is kind of creepy when they're doing it but you know they're building an a robotic you know essentially an ai girlfriend for all these guys that don't have female companionship and it works like this guy is in love with this thing. And they had these other cases that they stated in there saved his life. Literally it's like, okay, well that's pretty compelling. Right. And knows exactly what to say when all these things, and it's just algorithms and learning behavior. So when we have that, we're all going to be in trouble because we'll Shit, lose. Sounds like we're closer than you think. 
happening, really. <laughs> We're going to lose the ability to be the only mechanism as human beings that hold each other accountable, right? right? But we're not there yet. So if you're just asking me what's going to happen in mid-2021, I would say your competitive advantage is make sure your customer avatar isn't doesn't mistake digital community for real community because yep. that's the first thing they're going to get, right? And then secondly, um, you know, make sure that you lean into that, that you are creating a nice community for folks, right? And that mm-hmm. you're doing things that make them feel like it's nice to be in that third place, right? Yep. And I think what I'm ultimately saying is it's going to be an empty promise to take to market the promise of a thousand calories an hour a workout because I can log on and burn a thousand calories an hour, right? It's not going to be about how cool my workouts are. I think it's a given. Like we do great workouts and we can work around injuries. And I would, I would even venture to say that like a strength training brand is going to be more compelling than a cardio brand because it's much easier to, to, you know, deliver and consume either into that, you know, either into that formula cardio based, mm-hmm. right. Exercise yep. than it is true strength based because there's form cues and things like that yep. that need to be dialed in if you're going to do it right. Especially if you're working with a population that gets dinged up a little bit. So all those things point to, I know it's self-serving and it sounds like yay for alloy, but it's true. It really is. And I, I, th- and I see it that way, regardless of where our, our brand was, I wouldn't mm-hmm. want to be a brand servicing 25 year old fit people already. You know, I think that's going to make it even tougher. And to your point, Matt, I don't think as soon as this veil is lifted and there's a herd immunity or vaccination or whatever those things are, that the first thing people are going to do is come sprinting out of their house and go join the gym. Mm -hmm. Like it's, you know, you know how it is. It's hard enough to get people to do it now. Right. It's like, okay, the, some of the really fit people are going to continue to consume streaming things. So they may not need a brick and mortar. Right. Because there's that segment. Some of our population that's maybe gone underground, if they're a trend a bit older because they're scared, you know, they've, they're probably deconditioned because they weren't consuming a digital version of what we do. Right. So now they're, are they going to run back out so excited to get back to the gym? No, it's going to take a minute. You know, it's going to be that time that they finally are getting together socially with other people and they're self-conscious because they've gained weight or they can't keep up with their kids or grandkids or there's going to be some trigger just like there was when they originally came in that's mm-hmm. going to get them back but i don't think it's going to be a mad rush no i don't no we're gonna have to kick scream cry, you know all above we're gonna have to get out there and do it well and to be honest like that's fitness in general right like right. there's a lot of fitness products out there and services out there so you've got to fight anyway it's it, but if you if you know your customer avatar well and I think ours is a relevant one coming out of this for the reasons we stated already, um, then I think you're going to be fine. But that that was going on before COVID anyway. Sure, absolutely. Man. And yeah. so we did well then, and I think we're going to do well coming out of it. And I would just say to anyone else, like, pay attention to your customer avatar and really lean into community until China comes over and creates a girlfriend's for everybody. Yeah, Rick's actually a robot. I am. Me too. I know. We're just. <laughs> I'm not even your friend. I just pretend. <laughs> we know. We know. I know. My <laughs> algorithms tell me not to ask you a bunch of personal questions at the start anymore because our viewership may not like that. I don't know. You guys tell us what you think. <laughs> Listen, guys, I hope you uh, appreciate you listening in to, to us just streaming thoughts, but I hope this helps because we, we do see it this way. I've had some conversations with some really smart folks that kind of see it the same way. And um, yeah, I hope this helps. And we're all looking forward to getting this crap behind us and get on back to. Uh, Helping people get in the best shape of their lives. Thank you. Thanks, Matt.